Greetings, everyone. It is I, Tantus Nair Vanchikov, your Lord and Emperor here at the Chikovan Empire. Welcome. If you're joining me live on Twitch, hey, hello, Twitch. Say hi. I mean, you know, you've already been talking to me a little bit. For those of you joining me on YouTube, also hello. You can say hi in the comments down below if you want to. Today, we're going anime. Uh, it's not something I've done. A, I've done it a bunch on my channel in the past. I don't do it as much anymore. Um, I've experimented with various things, but one of the things I did want to do at some point in time was to talk uh, an update, because I talked about uh, Big Eyes, Small Mouth, or Bessem 3rd Edition back in the past, so maybe you've checked out those videos, maybe you haven't, if you're interested in the role-playing system, hey, they're there, uh, but there's a 4th Edition that came out in the interim, uh, like about a year or two ago, um, I could probably get the exact date where it came out. Uh, oh, 2019 now? Was it wasn't really that long ago. Could have been that long ago. This book, this has at 2019 on it. Jeez. Okay, anyway. So, uh, yeah, we'll be talking about it. God, it, it, time flies. Time flies. Anyway, we'll just do that. I'm just going to be going through the book. And I'll be talking about what's in the book and summarizing it, but if you have a copy of the book and want to follow along, I got a copy of the book because in this case I did the um, kickstart. I was a, a pledge in that one. So I got the copy of that, and I have a physical copy of the book, which is uh, somewhere around here. Right here. There we go, there's my physical copy of the Besson book. Uh, I also have this. So I indeed have my copy of it too and a PDF that we'll be going through um so yeah uh, we're, we're go going to go over everything in this book because again like I have gone over a lot of this stuff and I have to admit a lot of it hasn't changed um if you don't know about Bessem I will go over some basics of it it is a tri-stat system what does that mean you have three main statistics which represent yourself uh body mind and spirit and then it is a 2d6 system, meaning that you roll 2d6 and add a bonus number to it. I, we'll talk about it. Let's start with character basics, because, I mean, that's always good. They talk about the anime uh, multiverse, of session zero, these are important things. Where it comes down to the first major thing, because that's all set up. You know, uh, having a session zero, are you part of an anime multiverse, or specifically part of an anime, a particular one? Or are you part of something that's unique to whoever is creating your game, uh, your GM, your game master's rules? Regardless, though, your game master will determine the power level of your game. What does this mean, this power level here? Well, in the long term, short of it, it rem it's the kind of game you're playing. Uh, this is probably a little bit of equivalent to starting level in a, a, a in a particular like level-based RPG like D&D or Pathfinder. Uh, there are other systems that have basically levels of power or ways to be more powerful, and this is a very good way of judging how you should be. The amount of points that you're going to have and the power level you are is kind of determined the type of game you're going to play. Um, it's this is something that your your game master is going to tell you after kind of like establishing the type of world it is. Again, unlike a Dungeon and Dragons, which is very fantasy, or a Shadowrun, which is cyberpunk or sci fantasy, or worse, the game actual cyberpunk, which is straight up cyberpunk, or like when you talk about uh, a lot of other systems, they have a genre to it. This is a multi genre system, meaning that your game master is going to basically say like, here's the genre of play we're going to be doing. Or here's the genres that are appropriate, uh, you know, and give you an idea of what it is. So the eight power rankings are right here. Uh, subhuman, human, adventurer, heroic, mythical, superhero, superpowered, godlike. These point values are different from 3rd edition. So that's a big thing of, that I can say about this first and foremost. If you're coming from 3rd edition, these point values are about at least halved from what they would be in the uh, other edition. So that's a, the that's a beginning thing here. Um, a lot of things the point values have changed in, and that's one of the major things is sort of like they've reevaluated how the point values work in a lot of this. Um, heroic is the sweet spot for a lot of adventures. So that's kind of where the 75 to 99 is the area where you're going to be most of the time. Certainly there are human-based games, 
if you're doing something that's a little bit more unusual, slice of life, uh, like doing a high school detective game, you're just going to be normal humans. You're just maybe in high school and detectives. Um, you know, that's the idea of it. Adventures might be better for like starting out fantasy or just a simple like version of like a and d world might be for adventure. That would be your like first level characters. Again, heroic is a lot of characters there. Um, mythical, you're going a lot more about it. That's where your characters are all going to be like legendary martial artists or something like that. Um, top top of the line kind of characters. And then you've got superhuman, super powered, and godlike, which represent other levels of it. And it's not that you can't switch between these levels as you gain power and play. Uh, yeah. I mean, subhuman is just one of them that, like, there are, you know, certain creatures, sentient animals. You're playing as, like, a, a group of bunnies or something like that. There, there's gameplay for subhuman. It's just rare. Um, and it needs a good story for it. So, each of these power levels, reflected, you can read up on them, understand what they are. But there's just a general idea is it's, you're giving a general idea of how powerful how strong all of your characters are and how they compare to the baseline of just a normal person. Um, so yes, character benchmarks is another thing that kind of comes in here. And this is the very important thing. I'm going to tell you, the establishing boundaries here, just like the Session Zero, is also another important thing. We, I've talked about this in Discussing Tabletop. This is stuff that I talk about for just in general for any role-playing game, but it's nice that they talk about these things, the Session Zero, the boundaries and stuff like that, specifically in the book. That's nice. This is good stuff to talk about or to understand from your players, especially if they're new people that you don't know as much. But benchmarks is the other thing that related to actual character creation we can talk about. Because it means, depending on your power level, depends on mins and maxims of your character. Your stat values. I talked about your three stat system as it exists, kind of. Well, normally that stat system has a minimum of one, maximum kind of of 12. But they show here in the minimum stat value, uh, maximum stat values, yeah, and superhuman, superpowered, godlike, you can go above 12s, but 12 is kind of the top tier normally and you know humans hey seven's the normal maximum a human uh, level adventurer would have uh, maximum attribute levels are very similar to i'll talk about attributes but they are one of the major things that you have they're your special abilities and things like that as you're developing your character the max level you can have in some of them is determined by the attribute the attribute might only be one level or it might be four levels it might be two levels whatever it is the maximum attribute level, effective level, is given here. And the effective level is also the important thing to note because there's differences sometimes between levels and stuff there. Min and max combat values, um, that's an important one there. Uh, min and max health and energy points. Min and max damage multipliers. These are all major components of your character's build. And so having mins and maxes on them gives you an idea of where they should be and where they need to be for your character to be under that power level. Um, some of the stuff will happen naturally. Others you might have to tweak to make sure you're within it. Uh, sometimes you might build a character that's really cool and you might not meet a minimum also. It can happen. Rarely, but it can. Alright. So, uh, Character's framework, just is just ideas of your character's build, backgrounds, weaknesses, defining your character's groups, names. Uh, here we talk about some of the structures of the game mechanics, which I did go over. It's a tri-stat system, usually to add two numbers together. Uh, well, the entire day is there's a target number range, 6 being very easy, 24 being improbable, 12 being average difficulty. You roll 2d6, you add stuff to it. If it's just a stat roll, you add straight up your stats. If it's a skill roll, it's stats plus a skill. If it's initiative, it's your attack combat uh, plus any bonuses. Again, it's, you know, normally either one or two values added to your dice roll against the target number. Uh, damage multiplier is a thing. It was mentioned in the basic framework of your character, remember, uh, in, in, the, in the basics of your character. So you have things that will, hey, multiply your damage level. Base damage multiplier is 5, but increased by the massive damage attribute. 
Remember, we talked about over here... We'll go back to it. Uh, min and max damage multiplier. Two and four. Um, it's basically saying, like, where your base kind of line goes to and where it goes to. Anyway. Um, so, let's talk about the simplicity of building a character. Because it is a complex game here. And that's a thing here. And one of the major things they've introduced here is, of course, templates. They also say, like, um, if you want to keep things simple, other things is keeping customized. Customization minimum. We'll talk about customization. And there is a simpler set of rules called Bessem Naked, which I do have the PDF of, and I don't know if I have the book of that one. That might not, I might not have a physical book of. I would have to look through my physical books, and I don't want to do that at the moment. I... I'm just glad I was able to find this one as quickly as it is because I forgot to look for it, honestly, before we started. So, uh, hey, you know. Um, but one of the main simplicities that you can do to... Uh, uh, character quiz, just questions on your character for building it. Templates. This is the one of the major things that's been introduced here. This this existed in old, the third edition. There were templates, but templates came in much farther along. Basically, what they've done now is rather than have templates kind of be an afterthought, they've made it a major selling point of the entire game. Why? Because it simplifies things. A template is something that can be a... Uh, in various things, it could be something that changes your size, something that changes your species slash race. They still use race terms again, 2019. We've kind of moved on by that now to more species, ancestry, and that kind of thing. But kind of your species template... Uh, yeah. And then your class template. These three things very easily determine your character very quickly. And each of those has point values as a template, which then you spend a bunch of your points right away. Granted, you might have points left over that you can use to customize your character in other ways. But these templates give ranks, levels, information, basic stuff to build your character to the most basic levels, to give you a starting point to this. And you can modify some of these things here in the attributes. That's the thing is, you can modify stuff on your template too if you have points. So, size templates are the first ones. It's just this, like if you're larger or smaller than a normal size character, they just talk about the basic uh, way that it works. Those are one of the basic things. Here is the size modifier chart. Uh, medium is your standard human sized. Um, they go all the way down to a point and all the way up to monumental. It is uh, pretty crazy there kind of stuff. So, um, yes. And they give a rank two example of tiny, a rank one example of large, and how many points it is. Going smaller, turns out, tends to give you points. Because uh, you have more penalties and stuff like that. Again, uh, size of a character, and if it would be appropriate to be different sizes, is definitely something to discuss with your game master. Then we get into race slash species templates, which they have a lot of that vary on point value. As you can see, here is the list of them. I'm not going to go over the full list of them, but some of them, like Fairy, are minus 10. Giant Living Robot's a 70.1. Being a Slime is 0. Werewolf is 5. Vampire is 70. You can see the points difference. Archfiend, 80. Android Battle Maid, 60. And there are a lot of different um, genres, too. Yes, there's a bunch of fantasy stuff here, too, but there's also a lot of like different ideas for different things you can play as. Uh, Android Battleman, Archfiend, Azerite, Dark Elf, Dwarf, Fairy, Giant Living Robot, Grey, Half Dragon, Half Oni, Half Orc, Hod, Mosaiki, Kodamon, Nekojin. Yes, the cat cat person. You can be cat person for 10 points. Parasite, Shape Changers, Skeleton Key, Slime, Snow Maiden, Spider Demon, uh, Vampire, Werewolf, Wooly, and Yuri. Um, so I would say any of those interest you? Look into them. And again, they also have to be appropriate to what you're playing. If I'm playing high school detectives, most of that might not be appropriate unless it actually works in the world that your game master is uh, using or building. So, yeah. Similarly, class templates. 
is the other half of the kind of thing is you can kind of build your character. As you can see, there are plenty of different ones, and again, throughout different genres. And these thing also gives you a number of abilities. Um, a lot of this is less, like, if we take a look at these here, they can have uh, defects, stat values, attributes, a lot of different things. The classes tend to be much more straight-up attributes. So you're not getting a lot of stat effects, you're not getting a lot of defects, sometimes you might be in some of them, but the class one just kind of gives you an idea of, like, here's a major job for you. It's like taking a level of, like, if I took Human Fighter or, like, Fairy Fighter or something, you know, granted, in this case, it's Adventurer or, you know, Martial Artist or something or Mercenary or Ninja, Samurai, Pirate. I wouldn't just be, like, a fighter, but it's the same kind of idea from a, a Ancestry slash Species slash Race slash Class uh, guide to guide. So here we have Adventure, Artificer, Broker, Demon Hunter, Detective, Exorcist, Gate Guardian, uh, Gate Guardian, General, uh, Hacktivist, Hot Rod, Idol, you mean Idol, Magical Girl or Guy, Martial Artist, Master Thief, Mecha Pilot, Mercenary, Ninja, Pet Monster Trainer, Pirate, Samurai, Sentai Member, Shadow Warrior, Student, Tech Genius, Warrior. There is a bunch of them. Again, I would look into each of them if they are appropriate to you, and using of these templates doesn't isn't the be-all be all, end-all. Again, it's supposed to be guidelines that using those, you build a basic character, you can then customize it afterwards. But it makes it easier. So I definitely would recommend checking out the templates, seeing what's appropriate, seeing what's appropriate to the game you're in, talking with your GM about it, and figuring out if you can use any of them, and just cut off a lot of that. So here is the tri-stat system. Body, mind, and soul. Your three stats that you're going to have, which are representative you. While in something like D&D, you have six stats which represent you. Something like a White Wolf game, you have nine. And there's plenty of other games that have different things in between. Uh, you know, Pathfinder is also a six-stat system. Uh, Shadowrun has its own set of stats, uh, which I think are uh, four, eight stats, eight basic stats, and a couple of uh, special stats. Um, this is just a three-stat system. It keeps it a little system, a simple Bodies, physical aspects of your character, mental is your mind, and spirit is your luck, willpower, determination, and, you know, any kind of psychic and magical kind of abilities would be soul, too. Um, so, most of the time, you have a range from 1 to 12. Uh, 4 is the adult human average. That's an important thing to know right there. So, not only do we know it's 1 to 12, but 4 is adult human average. We already have the average value. Um, stats start with a value of 0. And st raising stat by one costs two character points. Um, so, you have to have at least spend six character points on your stats. Unless my race slash species template, you know, added some stats. Or, you know, something like that. Something else added stats. I'm going to have at least spend six here. <laughs> I at least have to dedicate that, if not more. If you want average human and everything it would cost you 24. The point values go up then. Having stats above 12 are possible, but it costs you four character points for each stat above the normal you would be. So four character points more. So think about it this way. A good way to explain this is from one to 12, it costs you two points per stat. So 12 would cost me 24. As soon as I've broken that marker, every point after that costs me four. So 13 would cost me four, 14 would cost me another four, so eight total. Um, 15 would cost me another four, 12 total. So getting a 15 in a stat would cost me 40. Because it would be my 24 from up to 12 and the four up above there. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. No, it's uh, actually goes up even more. No, no. It would be cost... 24, 28, 32, 36. Oh, it's 36. I'm sorry. I did my math wrong because I was adding it to the 13th plus uh, the the 13th level. It would be 16. Would be 40. Sorry. So 15 is 36. Uh, when you look at the bottom of a chart and you add onto the bottom of a chart, at least I noticed that for my uh, looking in the wrong place and making a math error because of it. Yay. <laughs> 
Huh. They talk about the shortcoming defect, which is something that's related into this entire thing. But this is your basic idea for stats. And remember, we built in to our character, now that we're here, here uh, reading your stats and stuff like that, we're over here, but we built into our uh, framework back here, maximums. A human, the maximum is seven. Meaning, if I want sevens and everything as my human character, it would cost me 42 points. Which is within human range, but it fills up most of my human. You know, I am I pretty much have just stats that. Uh, which is kind of weird, but possible. Uh, Adventure gives you another boost into that. And again, it, it, it's like you have more points to spend even if you want to have higher stats as you go on. That's another thing about the entire thing. Um, it splits it a lot more. Like, lower power levels, you are focusing more on stats if you want them to be significant. Anyway. But that's your stat system. Uh, next up is attributes. Attributes have levels. Most are leveled from 1 to 6. Uh, but you can create things with levels beyond this threshold. Um, it's kind of based on rules and stuff. Templates can give you some points there. It's flexible depending on your GM. There's enhancements and limiters that you can add into these. That's customizations. Which we can talk about. Because this is like the last thing you're going to spend on after your stats and templates. So. There are a lot of different attributes. I'm not going to go through all of these. I'm probably going to call out a few of them. Um, there are higher level, lower level att attributes. What do I mean by that? Well. Attributes have a name, a cost, a stat connected to them, and a description. Cost means... How many points per level it costs. An attribute that's cheap, one point per level, well, that's a very easy one. An attribute that's very powerful might be like five points per level. Something that a average human, if we're talking about those stats, or even an adventurer, might not have a lot of. So, this is kind of like an important part of it, entire thing. Um... There are notes for things. Uh, there's an asterisk for a human attribute. So they do note that here. If you are playing a game where you're just ordinary people uh, in, in general, uh, or you're kind of like human level, or even if you're like better than your average humans, but you're like in a world that's very normal. Like, it, it, just because we're playing in a very, you know, a, a, a game where we might be adventure level or something like that doesn't mean we can't just be human. Even the next level up from that, um, when we're back over here, I could have heroic characters that still would just count as human. I just would have to just use the human only attributes. attributes. Here is the chart. So, this just gives us the basic. It gives us the power. It has an asterisk next to it if a human can take it. If you're just like a normal human. And then it gives you the co level cost and what page it's on. As you can see, the level cost varies. The most expensive ones are like 10 per level. Very expensive. The cheapest are 1 per level. And there are a lot of different powers here. A lot of different ones. There are a few I'm going to hit up here. But most of them, we are just going to skip through. I'm going to be honest, there's a lot here. Uh, I'm just going to kind of go through here and take a look for ones I want to mention stuff. Um, uh, attack Mastery is just in it one dimension. It's your attack combat value, which we're going to talk about when we talk about derived values. It can be raised here. Um, just that's an major one. Uh, combat techniques just tend to be special abilities that are like almost like feats are in Pathfinder, D&D, either Pathfinder or D&D, even 5th edition or older ones. If anything that was a feat, that's a combat technique, kind of. The combat feat. Um, as you can see also here, some of the things here is some abilities also have their own enhancements. 
Enhancements and limiters are general customizations we're going to talk about. E individual powers can have their own ones, too, that might be in effect. So that's an important thing to keep an eye on, too. Um, defense mastery is similar to the uh, uh, combat mastery, so your defense combat value goes up. Uh, dynamic powers, which is one of the more expensive ones, is kind of represents that you have a sphere of a type of powers, and they change. Um... It's an open-ended tribute that you talk with your GM, that you kind of, like, alter your powers as need be kind of thing. It's supposed to be a, a flux of points you spend to purchase powers during different scenes and stuff as you need them. Uh, you don't... There are limits to when you change them, but it is one of the things, like, if I want to have, like, in general, a magical ability or something like that, or nature manipulation, I can kind of have that in... Represent in different ways. Extra actions, of course, gaining extra actions in a round. Special features, just little little things, like force fields. Gear. So gear and item are two abilities I do want to talk about. Um, gear represents access to useful but not very powerful equipment. Gear is things like backpacks, knives, clothing, consumer goods. Maybe you have a cell phone. Uh, you know... It, if this, it, it, anything that's appropriate to the setting. Like, if you're in an area that's a modern day, having a cell phone would be appropriate. It would probably be an item to have a cell phone in a fantasy world. You know, that's a probably isekai you're doing there. Um, but, like, you know, like a car, you know, something like that would be more of a piece of gear. Um, something that's a common vehicle. Um, nothing that's big. Uh... Guns, night vision goggles, burglary tools, expense, uh, expensive toolkits, tactical armor. Uh, for fantasy, it's melee range weapons, things like that. Uh, armor, poisons, work animals. That's gear. They're just items which are useful, but they aren't super powerful. And as you can, so that's one of the two stats that you might want to look at too. Gear can be important. So that was an important one to kind of talk about. Huh. You know, uh, item is the other one item would be, I have a very powerful item. It's like a magic item. So there's specific rules here in the item cost, but it would be like, I have a special magic sword, which has magic sword abilities, defined by this. You build the item using the rules here. It's specific. It's a lot more powerful. It's a magic sword. So, on one side, you have just junk you got, which is appropriate to the setting you are. This one would be stuff non-appropriate. Um, you know, this could also be technology outside the normal, uh, set of where you're from. Um, let's see if there's any more that I want to talk about. I think there is at least one more I do want to mention in here that I know about. Actually, two more. Two more that I know about off the top of my head. Range attack, melee attack, uh, range defenses, stuff like that. There's specific defensive and attack abilities where you have better for those. Skill groups. This is where I want to go to. Now, they do say one, two, or three points per level. What does that mean? Well, here we go. Boom. Here's what it means. Um, you get a skill group. Background skill group, field skill group, action skill group are the basic skill groups. Uh, and it tells you how many points per level it is. And then you have up from level one to six. So, it's a framework of things. It's basically a way. It's kind of how you're trained in a lot of stuff. Um, yeah. So, the idea is, like, here is the domestic skill group. It's skills that oftentimes without formal education have applications in daily life. What would that mean? It means, like, cooking might be under that. Um, you know, it's the idea of, like, rather than have specific skills, these skill groups are like an, a concept. And when a skill check is called upon, I, as the game master, would have to determine what skill group would be appropriate here. Um, so, as you can see, there are a lot of skill groups. You might not have 
any of them or all of them. It would be recommended that you probably have some skill groups, but like a couple, like one level of domestic might be like, you know, you general like uh, have some idea of some things that you can do in daily life. You know, there's occupations, artistic, academic, you know, would be going to school and stuff. Uh, probably up till high school would be academic levels. And then they kind of got into business, social, street, technical, uh, adventuring, detective, military, scientific. It's just that, like, if you want to make a check, you probably could, generally speaking, with body, mind, or soul. But this would be kind of like where it would fill. It's a very open-ended danger. There could be overlap between things. And if there is overlap, I would give you options which ones might, might be useful. You could be like, use this or this. But it's an interesting version of things that has existed. Third edition actually had a skill system that had skill points that you use an attribute to purchase skill points in and then get a whole bunch of different skills. This has simplified it greatly. That there's only these basically 12 groups. And I've got to be honest, there's a bunch of ones that might not be appropriate in anything. And, you know, it's like the idea of, like, adventuring probably isn't going to be that helpful in a, you know, high school detective game. It might be, but it might not be. Um, so, yeah. And the point cost is the unity between most Bessem games. Depending on the situation, a GM could move things around um, uh, like they say in a high school romance, student council drama kind of thing, the domestic skill could be more important down here than it is up here. Like, I'm going to admit, high school detectives, which I've been using a lot, domestic skill, I might put that in a field skill group. I might put that up a little bit more. That might be a little bit more important. Um, and that's the thing is specifically different things will alter depending on the style but that's generally speaking a case by case bis uh, uh, case by case thing most general games will use this set here this is the basics and then it's just like if you want to talk to your gym about it be like hey are there any skill group changes i have to know about with whatever you're running or playing and they would let you know <laughs> right I should have muted to blow my nose. I keep I forgot to do that today. All right. So that's kind of the basic everything else here. There is one more thing under this entire thing I did want to talk about. Uh, oh, yeah, tough. We can talk about it. Tough is extra hit points. There you go. That's, that's a thing there, too. Um, we want to talk about weapon. Oh, boy. Weapon is just something someone can do that's some form of attack. It is your basic, like, I'm inventing an attack stat. Now remember, an item or a piece of gear might already have some kind of basic weapon rules to it. Uh, there is an entire chapter, which we'll kinda, we can kind of take a look at. This is 134. Um, this is the area where they talk about things for, like, gear and stuff a little bit, too. Uh, and kind of some base kind of information and stats, too basic stats because remember some of this stuff is gear but they break it down in ways that makes sense to if you're buying it with points what level it is that kind of thing how many points it's worth and uh, item costs for buying it you know um they talked about the difference between it depending on the situation that you're in so that's the entire item thing they talk about armor and all that stuff here that's the, that's the thing is we're breaking away from that we're like do you want to shoot a fireball electrical beams do you want to have like a key powered strike create an energy sword from your hand you know maybe you have guns built into your body or missiles built in a beam weapon if you're a cyborg you know things like that um, the item attribute is your held stuff so you have to have something in your hand to do this this is I need no tool I just do this you know it's one action to a weapon attack and effectively, you design a weapon attack. It has its own damage. You customize it. Um, there is a level to it. 
There is a level zero. There's a level negative one. Those also exist. Goes up to level six for each weapon attack. I buy these separately. So if I want a whole bunch of weapon attacks, I would buy a whole bunch of them. You know, I would buy, you know, buy like four if I wanted four different weapon attacks. So, yeah. <clears throat> oh, well, wrong direction. Sorry. Um, the weapon enhancements are here. Again, similar to when I talked about enhancements and limiters. There's also limiters here. We'll talk about them, but that's specifically for weapons. All right. What do limiters and enhancements do? Well, let's talk about those briefly. Adding an enhancement or limiter to a tribute does not change its character points cost, but it can decrease with an enhancement or increase with a limiter the effective functioning level of an attribute by one for each assignment. Okay. Uh, weapon attribute has circumstances which it might be different. Um, adding enhancements uh, cannot uh, be... Weapon enhancements cannot be added to the effective level of troop drop at below level one. Weapons are the only exception of that. So I can add enhancements to a ability and it would drop the effective level of it but I can't go below one. This maxes out how many enhancements I can. On the other hand, limiters increase my effective level by one. Hmm. The four standard enhancements that are in here are area, duration, range, and targets. What, what does this all mean? Well, what it means is if a power can, uh, an attribute I have can have an area effect, I can increase the area effect. A duration, I can change the duration. Range, targets, I am basically, there are standards for this. And they show you the here on this chart, the allowable enhancements for area, duration, range, and targets to the different powers. Weapon, I can change area, duration, range, not targets. Already built into stuff with weapons. Size change, I can change the duration. Can't change it to make it an area effect. There's also uh, Potent here, too. Uh, can I talk about Potent on this chart here? Okay, so Potent's only applied to level 1 attributes. Um, so it's a special thing that you would add to, you know, a, a very low level attribute. Um, so, you know, Minor Edge, it's an extra one there. So you can take a look at that one. On the other hand, Limiters. They're restrictions on the scope of your attribute. If I have a limiter on it, my attribute doesn't work as well as it did. I'm doing something to make it less helpful. Um, they give an example here when you're using mind control as it kind of being a spell that you have to chant for a couple of seconds. You know, it takes time to activate the mind control. It's a limiter. Um, as you can see, there's a list of limiters here. <sighs> You don't usually apply limiters to companions or items. Um, and limiters are applied to individual attributes within that companion item, basically. And there's a list of uh, limiters here that you can see. We can go through. They're all things you can add in to limit it. They have unique limiters. They talk about those two. Now, there are also defects. See, there's a thing about it here. We've already built our character pretty well. We started with our templates, if we want any templates. Then we did our stats. Okay, we got our stats. Now we did our attributes. Uh, if they're human-only attributes, we did those. If they're anything, I selected an appropriate to whatever world we're in. Then I did maybe some customization. I felt like, oh, uh, most of these powers are fine, but a couple of these, I want to tweak them a bit, add a little bit of things, you know, like I want an actual fireball, so it has an area effect to it. I added an enhancement to my weapon thing, and maybe made it have it takes a little bit of time to use it because it's like a spell I'm casting. We've probably used up, generally speaking, all of our points. We really should have by now used up all of our points. Here's where we can kind of add a few things. Defects. 
they add points to your character point cost, you know? Um, so basically, um, here's how it works. You get defects. Um, one to five defects are the normal appropriate for your character, because you don't want to uh, be too defective and too many problems. Hmm. I switch over to my water. There are lesser, greater, and serious defects. And after you assign a few defects, your character's total character point cost is now less than the number of character points you were assigned by the GM. You have three options. So basically, like, as a GM... I'm going to basically say, like, you can get this many defects. Which I think we talked about in the character basics. Did they mention defects in the character basics? Let me just check. I think they did. Uh, that's just weaknesses. Uh, yeah. Ba -ba -ba. You know, it's just trying to figure out the... Uh, where are your cat your your DM your game master sorry assign stuff sometimes anyway you increase benefits add unknown elements bank for the future um so yeah effectively I get a few defects. And these negatives would make it below... Like, if my Game Master gave me 50 points, let's say, which is base level adventurer character, and I got a couple of defects, again, up to five. Five is kind of the appropriate one. So that's kind of normal. Again, you could always talk with your Game Master about having more. And these are negative numbers. Remember, I spent a whole bunch of my attribute points to build my character... Theoretically, I should have spent 50 already. So, it, it, the thing is, yes, there, there are times and places for things. But these negatives make my point less than 50. So, they say, I can go back and go back to my stats, my templates, my attributes, use those character points. I could use the points to make an unknown power attribute. Uh, basically, a hidden power that I'll discover throughout. Or, you can bank it for the future to use it at an appropriate time. That's for character uh, advancement. Again, defects have to be appropriate to bum 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 the game you're in. Like awkward size is not going to be uh, appropriate if you're using a size template. You're already using that. You know, uh, awkward size has its appropriate. Ba you know, there's this entire list here, and it's kind of like appropriateness has to be applied. But you take a look at the defects, see what applies to you, take a couple of them, you know, figure out a couple of things that might be appropriate to your the game, your character, some stuff to add a few extra points. It also adds a little bit to your character, and I think that's an important part of it, is you want a couple of defects at least. You don't want to go without defects, because having these defects is going to add like a little bit of weakness to your character, a little bit of like vulnerability as they say here but they not the actual thing i mean but like you know the idea that your character is not perfect in a way and these issues can come up because of it and these issues can be interesting and help develop your character a little bit then we have of course derived values hey remember combat values your attack combat value and your defense combat value they're things we talked about them a little bit and that you can raise them with attributes guess what they are your character value is based... Your combat value, for both, is basically adding all three of your stats together and dividing it by three. If I have straight fours and everything, I add those four, to, uh, four, four, and four together, equals 12, divided by three is four. My combat value is four. And you round down on combat value. That's at that point in time uh, that you look at your attack combat value and your defense combat value. They are, generally speaking, equal to, bum bum bum, 
your base combat value, plus levels of the attribute that's appropriate to either of those. There can be situational circumstances where your combat value goes up for specific things, like melee attack, power uh, attribute, range attack attribute, energy attack if you're using that. Certain uh, other attributes might add in certain circumstances an increase in combat value for a situation, whether it's attack combat or defense combat. But they technically start out at the same point. You then can deviate them with a combination of various different things. With defensive, uh, offensive attributes, defensive attributes, and various things that do that. Your health points are determined by your body plus soul stat times 5. Alright, again, if we're that average of 4s, that'd be 4 plus 4 is 8 times 5. 40 health points is what you would have. Um... How much damage you can take. Energy points are something that, generally speaking, it's similarly mind plus soul stat times five. Again, average of fours, you get that 40. The thing about this is, unless you somehow build into your character that you're going to use energy points, you traditionally don't really use them. I'll tell you how you do now. In older editions, you didn't really use them unless you kind of did something with them specifically in 3rd edition at least. They've made it a little bit more that you might use energy points in this system. Cool. If you go to zero, you fall unconscious. There are situations where you can go to zero health uh, energy points and go lower and begin to decline. You can use energy points in extreme moments to provide a boost to temporarily to a die roll. Um, you spend these points after rolling the die and apply a plus one die roll for every 10 energy points the character burns. Uh, you may add a maximum bonus to a single roll equal to your soul stat. Um, this is like a dramatic feat you can do. So this is something that we didn't have in third edition, or if we did, it was just, it eluded me in like one of the special rules that wasn't mentioned normally with it. Could have happened for me. Sometimes I miss these things. But I don't remember it, so it's been a number of years since I checked third edition. But this is a really cool use of energy points that makes it something that you can actually use. Extra bonuses to dice roll. Um, and the thing is, it's hard. It, you don't get energy packs uh, points back that quickly, too. It's sort of like you have to relax, relax and rest and stuff, so it is more bookkeeping. But it's a little bonus that you can use for dice things, you know. It'll little backup that they can use. And remember, though, go to zero, you go unconscious. So, there might be things that attack your energy points, too. That's an important thing. And then, of course, the damage multiplier is five. Uh, increased by a level of plus one per level of increased massive damage attribute. So, most weapons or other things that do damage have a basic level, which determines, like, where their damage is. So, if I have a weapon level two... How much damage does it do? 10. How'd I know that? Well, I went with the base damage multiplier, 5 times its level. 2. That's it. And there are things that, like, uh, for various weapons or, you know, other enhancements can, can alter this. Super strength attributes uh, can have effects on it, too. There's a lot of ways that your damage multiplier can be altered. Um, but the general idea is... Whatever weapon attack I'm using, or other type of attack thing that has a basic level, it could be an item that has a basic level of weapon to it that does damage, your base damage multiplier determines effectively how much damage it does. It's whatever level of weapon it is times your base ma damage multiplier. That's why damage multiplier is a very important thing to have. And again, you can increase it. I could have a base ma damage multiplier of 10. I do 10 damage per weapon level. That's a lot more than the 5. It's double. Uh, and again, work with your GM. Uh, they tell you here, again, work with them after you're done all this, check in with them. I would say, like, depending on the circumstance, you might want to check in with them during the course of it. But, like, you can fine-tune, get some suggestions, talk about how well it works in the storyline, work on background stuff and stuff like that. But we've pretty much then finished your uh, adventure. The other only things that I can kind of hit up on, I, I went to the item section before. Um, again, it gives a lot of information on weapons and stuff. Uh, there is a 
split between weapons and gear, remember? Um, yeah. There are mundane items, which are just basically free. Uh, like, here on our world, we would have clothes, television, Rick's watches would be mundane. Uh, smartphones, family uh, homes, all that kind of stuff. You probably don't have to have character points to have any of those kind of things. And again, there's a difference between gear and items too, but this general idea is if it's something that feels appropriate to the world you're in, like honestly, getting a mace, remember, is under gear for a medieval world, for a fantasy world. We were in the attributes level. Let's see what gear was here. Uh, gear was 95. Um, did I go beyond it? Oh, there it is. Gear. So, yeah. A knife. Consumer goods. Uh, and that thing is... Yeah. It's just as long as the stuff is easy accessible. That's kind of the idea about gear. This is like... Stuff that someone could easily get. And, yeah. I'm going to admit... Certain circumstances, like things like firearms, might be more difficult to get. But think about here in America. Uh, there are hoops you have to go through, but it's technically not that difficult to get a gun. Uh, in a medieval world, you'd probably be able to get, like, me melee and ranged weaponry, armor, and stuff very easily. And that would be an example of gear in a fantasy or medieval world. Where it's not an item. And where it separates. Where you get pieces of gear. It has to be appropriate to the world you're in. And that's where, like, uh, the differences can come about. Here they talk about, like, the basic item cost and stuff like that. And again, like, it would be up to me to determine if something is much more of a gear item or an item that you would have to purchase with the item power. Um, that's really the difference between it. It's sort of like... And again, it fits under the like mundane item kind of thing like that. Items have character... Po the difference between... And here's a big thing about it. Between items and gear. And mundane items... Items have character point protection. What the hell does that mean? Well, if I buy a magic sword and something destroys my magic sword or I lose my magic sword, um, through some other process, I should be able to get that back or have the option of getting it back. Um, and it should fit with the story very easily and not be something that like uh, is a distraction. Uh, because it's character point protected, my magic sword means that if something happens to it, unless I'm working with some kind of storyline with my game master, if it's just something that happens because of dice rolls and stuff like that, I should be able to get it back by next session. You know, mundane items don't get replaced like that. You can use character points to get mundane items, but then it has point protection. You know, it's... Gear has a general um, kind of like idea of some protection. Um, so, yeah. If you have gear, if the point cost is, ra is half rounded down, Less than your gear score, you can get it, basically, is the idea. And it's appropriate to being a gear item. Um, so, like, if we go to the chart here with point costs, like a battle axe is six. Which would mean I would probably want a gear of three. Oh, well, the item cost would be three. Actually, the item cost would be three. You go to the item cost. So, I would want a gear of one. I could have a battle axe. Because item cost of three, rounded down into halved. Um, is one, if I'm using the gear rules. 
again, gear rules are a little bit more protective, but they don't have the same protection as items. And again, we're not talking about mundane items too. Mundane items are outside the normal gear items. It's just stuff that everyone would have anyway. You know, it, there is a difference between gear and mundane items and items, and the distinction is a little hard to understand. Um, yeah. So. Start with this. Mundane's just normal crap I could find in a household anywhere, for whatever world it would be in. If it's a medieval world, I could probably pick up a bowl, a torch, a ladle, you know, things like that. Uh, probably some clothes, you know, maybe I have like, uh, you know, a, a, just simple things like that. I probably wouldn't have a lot of like weapons and stuff like that. That's not your average commoner, probably is not going to have that. Um, that would be gear, because that would be items that are acquired that are a little bit more difficult to acquire but they would still be appropriate to that world. Now, it's no longer mundane because not everybody has it, but me as a peasant type character, maybe I go out hunting sometimes and I go into some dangerous area. So I got like a short sword and a long and a bow in which to fire arrows to go hunting, you know? The sword for protection in case I need it against brigands that might sometimes show up in my area because, you know, that kind of thing. Maybe some loose armor or stuff like that. While if I wanted to be like, oh, I inherited a magic sword from my ancestor, it's an item now. So you see, we've kind of gone down the list. And even in the modern world, yeah, me having a smartphone is very, you know, modern world. It's very easy to have. But in gear-wise, maybe I have the latest model of a super advanced smartphone that's almost experimental or something like that. I mean, that might be too much more. But it would be like, I've got a really nice kind of like, your gear in a modern world would be like more exclusive versions of things, much more expensive things, stuff that's outside the guidelines of what a normal mundane house might have. You know, um, there are items like that, that exist. And then an item in a modern world might be something that's way outside that purview. Something that normal people don't end up with, even if it's a normal modern world. It could be specifically that, you know, through some family connections and stuff like that, uh, I get a, you know, weapon that would be normally not appropriate, uh, but through some, like, various connections to family, friends, associates, and kind of things like that, uh, stuff that's happened, I can own something that normally people wouldn't. Like, I, I don't know, maybe, like, I get special permission to own, like, a freaking alligator. Normally, you can't have an alligator. I, I don't know about laws locally, so I can't actually tell you if that's something that would be appropriate or not. Um, but I'm just giving an example of something that would be kind of, like, feels outside the normal purview of stuff, you know? Um, a tiger. I got a goddamn tiger, you know, that I'm like, ah, go, my tiger! <laughs> you know, it's a little weird, it's different, but that's like a level of like, uh, that'd be companion probably more than that because it's a pet. But item might be like a, um, honestly, I, I always joked about this in my youth. You have like a, uh, an old tank with the wheels converted to, with the treads converted to wheels because technically speaking in certain places, if as long as you remove the firing pin and you convert it, you can drive a tank on the streets. So, uh, depending on the place it's sort of like, but you get permission for that kind of thing. You know, you, you own a tank. You know, you've, it's, it doesn't have a firing pin. You know, I mean, you couldn't put a new one in. Um, but that would be very illegal, but just in case. But that might be item then, rather than either mundane or gear. So that's kind of have to like, mundane, everybody has it. Gear, it could be something most people would have. It's a little rare, a little harder to get, possibly get. Item is very rare, specific things. Uh, that can be critical to your character. And, you know, when you're creating an item, it makes it have that point cost protection. So that's the other thing about it is in a mundane world, like a just detective, high school detective world, maybe that gear items that you would get, instead you purchase some items because then they have character point prote protection. I'd say gear has a little bit of protection too, just not as much. It's not, it's not the mundane item, no protection whatsoever. But 
gear probably has a little bit of like, you know, theoretically could be replaced. It might take a little bit more. So. And then they go over just like the weapon list. I kind of went through that before. Then the armor list with the different types of armor from archaic, modern, futuristic. Uh, shields. Uh, mecha. Vehicles. They give a lot of these and that are their point cost. Like if you want an assault mecha, it's 120 points. Uh, a space fighter's 200. And you own it. Some of these things, I'm going to admit, if you're in a game which has them, uh, someone else might own them and just allow you to use them. Like the space fighter, uh, yeah. You know, if you're just a member of a space pirate ship, maybe you're the guy that uses that. The guy or gal. Just saying. Um, they talk about items of power and stuff like that. Breaking items and all their rules. Uh, I love how they do include blowing up planets there and destroying buildings under this entire section because of course they do. Companions, allies, enemies, they talk about them. There was rules for them. They give examples of pets and stuff and creatures. Um, I don't know why anybody would want to combine a wolverine and hippopotamus because that's just awful. It's just awful. Uh, talk about humanoid companions that you can have and give some example ones with their stats. Uh, remember, companion rules, we talked about those a little bit, and their point but costs. And it's just like you can purchase companions and vehicles and animals and all that kind of stuff and magical creatures. And here's an animal list and they're kind of like uh, points and stuff like that, just to give you an idea. And I think that's there you go. Honestly, I think that's everything I wanted to kind of handle in this. Let's go to the uh, top page of this book here. As I said, I'm just, I use the book as a kind of guidelines to talk about these different things as I go through them, and certainly, there are some differences between here and 3rd edition. If you've ever played 3rd edition before, it's going to feel familiar. Uh, the basic system of uh, rolling 2d6s, so these little guys here, and adding some numbers to them is pretty much the same. They redid skills, they made templates more important, they changed the point value and point cost of a lot of stuff. Stats are extremely cheap in comparison to how they were. It, I think it was like 10 points per level of a stat previously. Very expensive. That, that's another reason your point costs were like double or three times the amount that they would have been here. I gotta be honest, it, it was a lot more points that you were getting. Uh, this makes it a lot simpler. And the boundaries of those things now is a lot more set up. So it's, we have developed and basically taken what we had and improved upon it and changed some things in an appropriate way. This is very 4th edition Shadowrun to 5th edition Shadowrun, 3rd edition Bessem to 4th edition Bessem. It's going to feel familiar to you who have played Bessem. If you haven't, it's a fun system. I like it. Um, I've done it a few times here and there that I've run it on stream. If you want to check those out, I do have those uploaded to YouTube. Uh, my Best in World series, where I did two games. Uh, Worm, who was hanging around with chat a lot of times, was one of my two players that did both of those games. I did a, uh, two small campaigns, one in Cowboy Bebop and one in the uh, Full Metal Alchemist worlds. Both were quite fun uh, and quite different and interesting. And they were just storylines set in these worlds. And certainly you can do that. You can take a anime manga. You can take any world with Bessem because it is an open-ended system. It's best working with animes and manga because it's a certain style, but you technically can build anything in this. I could do a Bessem abusing a video game, a comic book, anything I really want. I could do superheroes in Bessem. It can be as appropriate as you want it to be because it's an open-ended system. And yes, again... Hinting at that big thing, a lot of those templates, a lot of the things that are built in, are very anime. They build that in there very heavily. Doesn't mean you need to be, but there's always that, you know, that heavy influence that exists in there. It's, um, it's such a way that I think that anybody can enjoy this, even if you're not really a big anime person. I think you can really enjoy Bessem as a game still. The thing is, I could run a very interesting open-ended fantasy world where, you know, spells and special abilities are a lot more open and dynamic, and you can have a lot more of that kind of cool ideas. 
it is a flair for the dramatic and a lot more I'm going to be uh, I think the best way to say it here is very much more movie more movie where you get a lot of interesting stuff in a traditional fantasy game or a lot of traditional RPGs Bessem and its flares and its special weapon attacks and its defects and its customizations and stuff and all of its powers really pertain to a lot more um, spectacle event. Doesn't need to be, but allows for a lot more of those storylines which have a lot more emotion and ups and downs. Um, so I think that's an interesting way of defining or talking about Bessem, which I can kind of say is a big part of it here. So, certainly it, it's a system I would recommend anybody checking out. You know, uh, or at very least, you know, if you uh, don't want to learn about it a little bit, uh, it might be appropriate to something that you want to play. It might not be. And as I said, as a GM, I, I one day I want to run more buses. Uh, it's my plan to run more. You know, hopefully more on this channel at some point in time within the next year or so. You know, I did want to talk about this update because this is an update to all the stuff I did before. So I hope uh, anybody out there that enjoyed my previous Bessem stuff or even didn't really know about it might be interested in it now. Hey, cool. Here's an update to a bunch of stuff on how to basically play and stuff. And honestly, I've given a basic rundown of playing the game. There's more to it after that, but I don't know how much interest there would be for people to talk for me to talk about it now. And it's probably not going to be a full wouldn't be a full video. So that's a question. If I do more in the future, I don't know. There are more books. Maybe I can talk about how the Bessem Naked is a little bit easier, and maybe how that's different from uh, it, the uh, simplified version of the rules. There's some things that maybe I'll do in the future. But for now, I think that'll leave it out there. Um, I hope you learned basically what Bessem 4th Edition is, a basic idea how to play it, and definitely how to build a character. Um, remember, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays are my days that I stream on Twitch live, tabletop talking, where I go over stuff like this. You can join me then. You can check it out on YouTube when I upload it afterwards. Um, always good for support. If you are over on Twitch, hey, give me a follow. If you're on uh, YouTube, give me a subscribe. Like the video. Maybe give a comment. Say something in Twitch chat. These are all ways of interacting with me if you're live over there. You know, wherever you're at, give me some interactions. Hang around. I hope you enjoyed this. Um, remember, check out all my other stuff. Check out some of my best and stuff before. I had a huge guide of where I was talking about various different animes of all different genres. I was taking so many different genres to try to have variety um, and talk about how to do them in third edition. Honestly, most of that stuff kind of pertains. It, it, there are some definitely changes that have to be done. And maybe I'll have a guide for updating between third and fourth edition at some point in time. That might be a thing to do too. Uh, updating for But um, yeah. I'm going to say bye for now, and uh, yeah, I think that's all my shout-outs. Uh, Wednesday, live play in the evening, discussing tabletop on Saturdays, and Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, I play some video games in the morning on uh, Twitch, too. So if any of that kind of stuff interests you, check it out. That's where my live streaming is. These videos go up on YouTube fairly daily, usually a day or two after I have done them. Um, so yeah. Anyway, everybody, farewell. Have a great rest of your day.